Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it, with the new Galaxy S24 Ultra, and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. You got called a COVID denier. You'd have to call all of Europe COVID deniers because they prioritize children and they open schools. People need to find the courage to speak out. Well, hello, everybody. It's Fill in the Blanks, and it is time to fill in some real blanks about something. This today is a special episode for me because it is addressing some issues that are really near and dear to my heart and are getting more so every single day. My guest today is a national champion. Now, let that sink in for a minute. A national champion, gymnast an Emmy-nominated documentarian. Now, we just talked about three things, all of which are rarefied air. Think about what it takes to achieve one of those things, let alone those three. This is someone that has experienced firsthand the price that one sometimes has to pay in today's hyperpolarized society when expressing personal opinions on social media. Now, This is a big deal to me. I'm talking about someone that served as brand president for the iconic American clothing giant Levi's. She helped double the company's revenue during her over 20 years of service. And when some of her views on how to handle the COVID crisis in our public schools clashed with official Levi's policies, she was asked to quiet down, which led to her leaving the company. I'm talking about Jennifer Say, and she is in the crosshairs of cancel culture and is here today to share her experiences and insights into how she has chosen to handle today's toxic social climate. Now, those are my words, toxic social climate. I doubt that she would disagree with that much, but we'll find out. So welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Do Do I say Dr. Phil or Phil? Either way, that's Either fine. Way. Most people call me Dr. Phil, but I think that's because I've been coming in their living rooms every day for 25 years. So I think that that's... seems fair. Now, let's talk about what you got involved in, in terms of your gymnastics before we get to some of the sure. other things, because you got really started in this at a young age, right? Yeah, I was about six when I started, um, which is not unusual. Um, it's a fun sport for little kids. And I, you, know, you have to remember, I was starting in the 70s. This was just a few years after Title IX had passed, which gave girls and young women kind of equal opportunity to play sports and do sports in college. There weren't a ton of options for girls in sports. I was sort of choosing between dance, cheerleading, and gymnastics. And Nadia Comaneci hit the stage and, you know, the world stage in 1976. And I was completely enamored. Right. As one was, because she was a kid. She was 14 years old and we all related to her. And I was doing sort of rec classes at the time, but then I just became completely obsessed with gymnastics. But we didn't have other choices. There weren't soccer teams and, you know, all this other stuff that my girl, my daughter can play anything my son plays. Those opportunities weren't really there in 1976. Yeah. When did you know that it was more than a sport, a hobby, an interest, that it was a real life passion for you? It sounds crazy to say it, but I was probably seven. I mean, I loved it so much. And the thing about gymnastics, which is becoming less true, which I'm grateful for, is it was always viewed as a, a sort of young, or at least as when I did a, a young girl sport, a child sport. And so you had this very narrow window of opportunity. It was sort of viewed that you couldn't really do it past 16 or 17. And so the intensity started very young. And so by seven, I was going four days a week for two or three hours at a time at seven years old, which seems kind of insane. And I started competing at seven and I made elite, which is the, the highest level that you compete for a spot on the national team by the time I was 10. Wow. I've known some gymnasts that have done that sort of thing. And I watched what it did 
to them and to their families making sacrifices, actually moving to get them to coaches and all of that. It affects a lot. It affects everybody in the family. It, it absolutely does. And I think, you know, I, I um, had some challenges with my family as I left the sport for a long time. But as I look back now and as a parent myself, I think I was a very difficult child to parent. Um, I was very driven. I wanted to go to the next level. I wanted to go to the next club and I wanted to, you know, it wasn't enough to make the national team. I wanted to be in the top six. Like, I don't know what you do with a kid like this. And my parents did absolutely everything they could to support me. Now, one could argue they went too far because the entire family then sort of revolved around me doing the sport. And when it became a bad situation for me and I was very physically damaged and emotionally just falling apart and I wanted to leave, that was just unthinkable at that point for my family because they'd sacrificed so much. They put so much into it and it's like, now you want to quit? Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's, it's hard for them to wrap their head around. It is, and I and I understand that. But if you can't see what's happening to your child right in front of your face when she is just disintegrating, and I mean, I was suicidal. I it was it was horrible. But and to not be able to see that and put your child first, I think it's a. I would caution any family to put any child's activities at the center of that entire family's existence. It's too much pressure for the kid. Um, I don't know how you find that balance of support, but not you know, derangement (laughs) and having it take over the entire family's life. Um, So yeah, it got, it got tough towards the end. It was a ton of fun until it wasn't. Um, I had a lot of injuries. I trained on a broken ankle for two years. I broke my femur at the world championships. I kept coming back, but um, that kind of those, those serious injuries and the pain, because I always came back before I was fully healed existing in that much pain and training with that much pain wears on the psyche, as you might imagine. And then eating disorders are rampant in the sport as well. Yeah. Cause you get told a lot, you're fat when you're not, you got to be small. It gets really pushed on you. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, we were weighed in twice a day. Our weight was announced over the loudspeaker. We were shamed and called horrible names for gaining a quarter of a pound. Um, I mean, the bullying and fat shaming is sort of, incomprehensible to me now. And I thought in my teenage brain, these behaviors that I was adopting, because I was told lose three pounds by tomorrow or you can't go to the competition. And keep in mind, I was you know, 98 pounds and 17 years old at this point. Um, I thought I could manage the behaviors. I thought it was sort of situational and that once I left the sport, I'd be normal. But of course, that's not what happens. You internalize all these beliefs about yourself. And I struggled with an eating disorder for many years after I left the sport. Yeah. It's hard to just turn that off because it just becomes part of who you are and how you see yourself. And your lifestyle. Yeah. You say your parents got tunnel vision, just refused to notice this downward spiral that was going on because they were so focused on really in one sense, trying to get you what you wanted, but they had so much invested in it. I guess there's so much conflict, they can't see what's going on. They don't want to see it, can't see it, don't see it. Yeah, all that. It's a, it's a good description. And we were so embedded in this community. I mean, my mom worked in the gym at the front desk. You know, her identity was very much tied to me being one of the best kids in the gym all the time. We moved our family from New Jersey to Allentown, Pennsylvania. I initially moved by myself and lived with a coach at 14. That was too difficult. My mother moved. Um, then the whole family moved. Um, so we reorchestrated our entire lives around my gymnastics. And that's a lot of sacrifice for parents. I would just, it, it's it's hard. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, I would say I wouldn't do that right now for one of my kids. I think it's too much pressure for a child. I don't think it's healthy for the family dynamic, but I don't fault them for it. They were trying to be supportive. Right, of course. Is it your fear that this kind of thing is still going on today in gymnastics? Oh, yeah. I mean, we didn't get to it, but I wrote a book in 2008 um, called Chalked Up, which was a memoir about my time in gymnastics. I, you know, I continued to suffer um, from basically what was a culture of 
abuse, you know, extreme emotional, physical abuse. There is sexual abuse, as, as we now know, because of the case of, of, of Larry Nasser, but it was very prevalent and present when I was doing it as well. The national team coach in the 80s, the Olympic coach, is now banned from the sport for uh, sexually assaulting athletes on the national team. Um, this was the environment that we grew up in, and I continued to struggle with that into my 30s, and I eventually wrote a book about it. Now, I did not realize how controversial it would be. I, you know, I thought all of this was an open secret, not a secret secret that we weren't allowed to talk about, although I should have gleaned that. Um, and so I was just, it was, you know, I know we'll get to COVID and open schools, but COVID and open schools is not the first time I've been dragged on the internet and called horrible names. Now it was in a smaller, tinier community before. It was sort of gymnastics and the larger youth sports movement, but I was deemed a liar and a grifter, just sort of bitter about not making the Olympics and out to make a buck and, you know, dragging these good men through the mud, these, these coaches who abused young children for no reason. Um, that I went, I endured for 10 years. Well, right. The book chalked up really pulled the curtain back on all of that. You did receive a lot of praise for the book as well, but you were attacked. And as you say, people were just saying, oh, just sour grapes because you didn't get what you wanted. So now you wanted to trash the sport. That was basically the the, the assessment. Most of that was coming from inside the community um, because I was criticizing our community. People outside, it was sort of more accepting. You know, I shine a light. They watched gymnastics every four years at the Olympics. They thought it was really cool. And these bouncy little cute girls were jumping around and they were like, oh, I never thought it was that bad. Like they didn't necessarily question my accounting of it, but inside the sport, um, I mean, I was essentially excommunicated, but you know, it, it's not just being called names on the internet, you know, being threatened with lawsuits. And I had to cancel readings because there was violence that was threatened and all of these kinds of things. So it's fine. I got through it. I think the most, I, the, the thing that just still doesn't sit right with me is, you know, Larry Nasser, and I know you had Judge Echoline on recently. I think you spoke with her recently, but Larry Nasser, who was the Team USA gymnastics doctor for 30 years, went to prison for life for abusing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of young athletes. And it, you know, when that story broke, it, it implicated the entire sport and the culture because he was harbored, aided, and abetted by the leaders in the sport. And so now suddenly we were allowed to talk about this. Um, and everyone who came at me said, oh, we always stood with you, which is a lie. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, to the, welcome to the fight, but it's, it's not true. Um, but someone has to go first. Someone has to say a thing first. I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. <laughs> the foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started but this we're podcast. Not, not Stop saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Okay, let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> the interesting thing about that, and what I wanted to point out about this, because as you said, we're going to get to the COVID in the schools right now. But the reason I wanted to point this out and start where it started with the gymnastics was for two reasons. Number one, you obviously are a woman of great determination. You have the ability to discipline, set an objective, stay with it, go after it. And when you wrote Chalked Up, you were an outcast, ostracized by the community. And I've really looked at what happened after that book, what some of the comments and feedback, really where it came from and what it was. And the people that were saying a lot of the things they were saying knew damn well that what you were saying was true. They, in fact, were experiencing what you were calling out, but yet they were closing ranks because I guess once you're in the middle of it, it's like cognitive dissonance. You have to justify it in your own mind in order to continue to go through it. You have to find some way to make it okay. But it was so ironic that a lot of the people that were yelling the loudest were actually suffering what you were talking about the suffering being. 
Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I think that's one of the great sort of ironies and one of the most harmful aspects is that, I mean, it's almost cult-like. So you're conditioned as an athlete to believe that it's your fault. If you are feeling pain, emotional, physical, it's your fault. You were, if you, if you're think, if you think you're hungry, and they're screaming at you that you ate too much and you're fat, it's your fault because you ate too much. If you are limping around on a broken ankle and trying to train and you're told you're a lazy piece of garbage, it's your fault. You're not injured, you're lazy. And so you internalize this shame and it's all your fault. And you carry that with you beyond the sport, just like the eating disorder. And so, yes, those that close ranks, they were suffering that same sort of conditioning um, that they believed it was them. Now, I think what's really interesting is the film that I produced, which you referenced, Athlete Day, which came out in, um, in, in 2020, what I really wanted to do was connect the Nasser story to the larger culture of abuse. And it prompted this outpouring of young athletes around the world and retired athletes telling their stories of abuse. And the, the letters that I got, emails, I guess is more accurate, I didn't even know this was abuse. I knew I was suffering, but I didn't connect it. I would hear the most egregious stories about sexual assault, and I thought, oh, lucky, I did not go through that. But for them, the way it was laid out in the film, they realized that their continued suffering was a result of this emotional, psychological, and physical abuse, and they could name it finally. Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, my wife, Robin, is such an advocate, and a real ambassador against domestic violence and abuse of children. And one of the things that she's come to learn over the last 20 years is that so many people that are abused don't know they're being abused until somebody frames it for them. I can tell you in the time that I've spent in private practice, there were so many people that I dealt with that never knew they were depressed until they weren't. Yeah. They just thought this is the way life is. They thought this is normal. You get up every day and you feel terrible about yourself. The sky isn't blue. <laughs> Music doesn't play. They didn't hear any yeah. joy. They never knew they were depressed until they weren't. People don't know they're abused until somebody comes in and says, this is not normal. This isn't the way everybody else lives. Well, they don't. you don't know that. This, like I said, I started at six. I, what did I know? This is what sport was to me. This is what co this was tough coaching. I wanted to be the best, and this is what was required. I had I had no idea. And then the thing that that, that just makes it so messed up is, as you suffer because of the abuse, you and you make that your fault. A great therapist, thank I'm very thankful for, explained it to me when I think I was forty. And he said, when a, when a mother who abuses a child or a father hits a child, that parent might say, I wouldn't have to hit you if you weren't so bad. Right. And suddenly that was like this light bulb moment for me. And I realized that that is what had happened. I wouldn't have to scream at you. I wouldn't have to force you to train on a broken ankle. I wouldn't have to take food away from you if you weren't such a piece of garbage. Yeah. Um, that's, and But you're right. It's that reframing and that recontextualizing that is just like this light bulb moment. And I think a lot of um, athletes had that when they watched Athlete A. And I'm grateful and so proud that I was able to do that. And you had this outpouring of athletes saying, no more. This has to change. The number one tool of the abuser is isolation. And what happens when you get into this kind of cult-like, and I'm using that in a generic sense, but it's certainly an insular community where Everybody sticks together. They control the thinking and they talk to each other. They don't go say, hey, I'm in this sport. How does this sound to you? The whole idea is you don't talk to anybody else. You stay among yourselves. And that's how they get away with this. And children have this unique ability to figure out how if things go wrong, it's their fault. Because the number one need in all people is acceptance. They want to be accepted. They want to please these authority figures. And so when you start at six, you're toast. You have no chance unless you have an adult looking out for you. And as you say, your parents, and I know you're not here to throw them under the bus, but they didn't see this disintegration. They didn't see this falling apart at the time. Yeah, I think, first of all, in gymnastics, parents are often not even allowed in the gym, which is a problem. No, my kids can't go anywhere that I'm not allowed. I mean, I might not go all the time, but I should be allowed in. 
Um, I also lived away from home for a while, so they weren't seeing it directly. But I think the bigger issue is in this culture broadly, we associate winning and success with happiness. So as I was disintegrating, I was winning national titles. I was making the national team. And so they interpreted my emotional falling apart as just stoicism. And, and I was quite stoic. I didn't tell them what was going on, really. So, you know, I think I was a difficult child to parent, like I said, but I think there was this just conflation. She's doing so well, she must be happy. And they were able to kind of brush aside the serious physical injuries and the, and the emotional harm that I, was, that I was clearly suffering from. But it's also because they're in the cult, too. So, you know, outsiders don't understand if you if you told I mean, I remember telling a friend in school once about something my coach had said and the horror on her face. It, it, any normal person <laughs> would have found the coaching methodology horrifying. But the kids and the parents are in this bubble and you're not supposed to talk about it because they don't understand the outside folks. Yeah, they don't realize what it takes, and that's we're special. That's the price that you pay to be at that level, and that's what they look at. Here's the thing: you decided to write the book. You decided to pull the curtain back. You decided to do the documentary. That all took a lot of commitment on your part. And you said something a few minutes ago. I got attacked, and I got through it. That was fine, and. It really wasn't fine, but I buy that. I got through it part. But that all set up what I think is a resolve that led to the next chapter because you were hugely successful at a corporate level with Levi's. And then you got into what I think, now this is just me giving my opinion. I'm not putting words in your mouth. You can say what you want. This is just my opinion from the outside looking in to a real hypocritical situation, you started to advocate against school closure and mask mandates. And they had a problem with that because you were very high up in the corporation and they didn't see how you could separate your personal situation as a mother and having those private interests not reflecting on the corporation with you being in a high position. That was their point, right? Yeah, you got it. So they said, we want you to quiet down. Yes, repeatedly for two years. Um, can you stop? You need to stop. You need to think about, you know, when you speak, you speak on behalf of the company. I said, no, I don't. I'm a mom of four. I'm a mom of public school kids. I'll take Levi's out of my bio. I'll take my title out of my bio. I'm talking on behalf of children, as I've done for the last 10 years in the sport of gymnastics. Are you telling me to stop? No, we can't. Okay, then I won't. That was sort of the conversation for two years. Now, this is not a corporation that didn't speak out about social issues, correct? Yeah, often led by me. I mean, I was the chief marketing officer for eight years, so I led the messaging. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, look, Levi's is a company that has a long history of what, what they would call it profits through principles, you know, progressive values. It, it started, I mean, Levi Strauss himself in, you know, at the inception of the company, the first profits he made, he gave to an orphanage. This was sort of in the DNA of the company. And the approach had been very much about taking care of employees. So the best example of this is in 1992, they were the first Fortune 500 company to offer same-sex partner benefits. That's before anyone talked about marriage equality. So there was a whole series of events um, integrating factories in the South before the law required it. Um, but at a certain point in the 2010s, we started to talk more publicly about these things. And that was that was led by me. So, you know, I'll, I'll own that. Um, but, you know, the issue here was the company was not taking a stance on this. And so if the brand president was, it appeared that we had a perspective on it. I'm representing their view when, in fact, we did not. When, in fact, the company's perspective was we're going to adhere to local public health um, guidelines, which said public schools should be closed. Now, I should mention throughout this, starting in the fall of 2020 anyway, all of my peers who were telling me to stop were sending their kids to in-person private school. So, you know, their 
pushback with me was that I was violating and going against the CDC and the public health authorities in the local area, in the Bay Area. I didn't say this at the time, but what I would say now is, no, you were. You sent your kids to public school. My kids were home on Zoom. Right. So they were saying one thing publicly, but personally, privately, they were sending their kids to private schools where they were in the classroom. That's right. The hypocrisy of that made me so crazy. I can't even, I mean, I, I guess they think I'm crazy, but it's, it just roiled me to no end because the harms were so obvious and they're widely reported now, you know, the harms of the school closures, the learning loss and the, you know, emotional, social, developmental loss and the depression and the teen girls are suffering and all of these things, you know, the learning loss being the starkest for those states that were closed the longest. California was closed the longest. This was all obvious to me. It, 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 Europe prioritized opening schools in, the, in May of 2020, and then what we would call red states did so in August of 2020. It just all seemed so inherently classist and frankly racist to me that this, the kids being kept out of schools were the lower income schools, largely black and brown students. And it, I, I didn't understand how anybody could sit by and accept that when everything in the ether was we're fighting for equality. I didn't understand it. I, you know, I just, I didn't. <laughs> well, I think people just pick and choose when they want to pay attention to science and when they don't. The idea of pushing for school openings got conflated with being anti-science, yeah. and you got called a COVID denier. The fact of the matter is, there was not then, there hasn't been during the pandemic, nor is there now, any solid science to suggest that closing the schools was ever empirically supported, that there was ever any data that suggested that this was in the best interest of the children, physically, mentally, emotionally, medically, or otherwise. That, that's correct. And if, if you're going to call me anti-science and a COVID denier, then you'd have to call all of Europe, literally all of Europe, anti-science COVID deniers, because they prioritize children and they open schools. You know, someone might come back with a retort saying, well, yeah, but they had to close an extra week at Christmas. I'm sorry. That is not the same thing. California schools were closed for 18 full months. So it's just, you know, it, they prioritize children. I think the other issue, Dr. Phil, is just this myopic view of public health as being about one thing and one thing only. And we're create we created through policies all of these unintended consequences, although I think they could have been predicted, and adverse impacts that for children are more harmful uh, than the disease itself. Well, uh, you're certainly reading my mail here because from the very beginning, the position that I have taken, and there are others that have done the research, not on this pandemic, but where there have been prolonged quarantines in other countries, such as Peru, where there have been extended quarantines where children have been held out of school, and they have looked at what has been the impact of remote learning, particularly in the lower grades, where there has been remote learning, and they've measured it going into the quarantine and coming out of the quarantine these are quantitative studies. These aren't opinions. They measure what the child knows going into the quarantine and experiencing remote learning and what they know coming out of the quarantine and remote learning. And they virtually learn nothing, certainly in the lower grades. It impacts most the lower socioeconomic children, the children of color. They have poor connections to the internet. They have fewer devices in the home. They're Parents are less apt to work from home because they have jobs where they have to be on site to perform the tasks, so the children are left to their own devices. There are a number of confounding factors. We also know if a child is not reading on grade level at the end of third grade, their likelihood of dropping out before graduation is six times normal. The number of years of life lost ultimately 
is staggering for these children because they have less occupational attainment, which means they're higher risk jobs with lesser insurance coverage, slower disease detection. All of this stuff obtains. There's not anything that points to this being a good thing for the children, mentally, emotionally, or physically. That's right, which is why the pre-pandemic playbook, as published by the CDC, said we never close schools longer than six weeks, even in the very worst situations with 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 um, with pandemics and with diseases that are more severe in terms of the fatality rate. We don't close longer than six weeks because the harms are just too great. But we threw all that out the window and every we knew all of that. What you just said, um, that if a child doesn't read by third grade, his likelihood of dropping out is increased exponentially. Um, and this isn't even to speak of the services that kids get in school beyond. I mean, some kids eat because they get to go to school. You know, if you are on in San Francisco, where, where I used to live, 60 percent of children are on the free or reduced lunch plan. That means they got lunch, they got breakfast and a snack to take home. The schools tried to facilitate that, but it didn't it didn't it didn't really work. There also there's so, social services provided. There's abuse intervention. There's all of these things that just didn't happen. Um and at the same time in, in San Francisco, anyway, they had these learning hubs. So that, you know, where, where children could go with decent internet service. So these are staffed by hourly wage workers. Why can these people go to work? Why, why can we subject these hourly wage workers to babysitting these children? And that wasn't continue, considered dangerous, but a school with, you know, aggressive mitigation policies couldn't have a teacher in the classroom. Even when San Francisco schools opened, and I, I hesitate to call it open in May for a few hours, you had situations where the kids were in the classroom and the teacher was at home on Zoom. That's not school either. So the whole thing, we knew the harms. It's not two weeks, two months. It's potentially a lifetime for far too many children. And that doesn't even get at the children in third world countries who were sold into child marriage and went to work and will never go back to school um, that followed our lead, frankly. They followed the lead of the United States in closing schools. And I, it, it's just a culture that does this, a society that does this does not value its children. What bothered me most about Levi's approach with you is you said they were saying you were ignoring science in the positions you were taking when the exact opposite would be true. They were ignoring science. There's an interesting study that it's actually not come out yet, but will very soon by the National Bureau of Economic Research. The authors are University of Chicago economist Casey Mulligan, Stephen Moore, and Phil Kirpin of the Committee to Unleash Prosperity. They compare COVID outcome in the 50 states and the District of Columbia based on three variables. They look at the economy, education, and mortality, and they really compare the states like Florida that didn't shut down the economy and the schools to California, which shut down virtually everything and wrecked the economy. And of course, the variable is mortality rate. And there's non-significant difference statistically. They didn't save lives by shutting down and crashing the economy and wrecking these kids' educational advancement. There's no science to support this. So was it simply to cover the fact that they didn't want attention brought to the fact that their kids were in school? What was the motivation? Oh, my goodness. It's such a big question. I mean, why were the doctors and scientists that raised from the very beginning that there was another way? Why were they silenced and demonized? And, you know, there were plenty of doctors. There was Martin Pulder from Harvard. There was Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, Sunetra Gupta from Oxford. They were deemed fringe insane people. I mean, these are not crazy people. And they said the path forward is to protect the vulnerable and let children go to school and have their lives. Um, and, and, you know, it appears they were right, but they were absolutely shunted um, to the sidelines and not just shunted, but vilified as just quacks and crazy people. So, you know, I think it's not so much about why Levi's did this. It's why was the, this was the they're just a representation of what the world was doing. I mean, all of San Francisco was saying what they were saying. Why was there this silencing of debate? Why could there be no dissent? Why couldn't we look at data, which was what I was doing obsessively since the beginning? Um, we were 
you know, following these democratic talking points, and I am a Democrat or former Democrat, as if they were they were they were gospel. And frankly, journalists really failed here as well. Um, they failed to interrogate the issue. They printed you know, CDC press releases as if that was journalism. All of this data was available. If I could find it, why couldn't they? Why couldn't they challenge the narrative? The question is why? I, I, and I, you know, for the life of me, Dr. Phil, I, I don't understand it. You know, I think it started as a response to Trump saying schools should open, maybe. I mean, it started with real fear and panic. Then it was a response to him saying schools should open. Then I think there was this idea that if the Democratic Party was the party that cared about teachers and saving lives that they would win the presidential election. But it was just at this point in the ether, the fear and the terror and the righteousness that good people stayed home and kept their kids home. And why do you make a big deal of this? You're just an evil, horrible racist who wants teachers and children to die. It's like they couldn't manage the message <laughs> at a certain point. I, I'm not I'm not sure. Levi's is no worse or better than anyone else. They were sort of caught up in that storm. My feeling is, though, there was a way to handle it and handle it differently. Um, they could have said from the beginning, because employees were complaining about me, and I think that's what really kind of got them. Why, why isn't it, why not have the sort of leadership and moral courage to just say, you don't have to agree with her. She has a right to say this. She's a public school mom speaking up for her kids and other public school kids. She has a right to say it and we support her just like you have a right to say what you believe. Um, and I think that would have ended it and we could have all just moved forward, but that's not what happened. You know, they fell prey to the angry mob. Well, it's interesting now, when you do see the results now, when people have the science staring them in the face, when you see a study that ranks Florida 28th in mortality and California 27th, but Florida is third in the least educational loss and California is 47th, you would think these people would now say, um, Never mind. They'll say Republicans wrote the study. That's what they'll say. Yeah, of course. People can replicate the study. You can get Democrats to replicate the study. You can get left-leaning liberals. You can do blind studies. It is what it is, but no one has said anything back to you about, hey, uh, not only, A, do you have the right to your private life opinion, and, oh, by the way, you were right. Nobody said anything like that to you, even off the record. Oh, goodness, no. No, no, nothing like that. In fact, there are reporters writing hit pieces on me. There was one just about two weeks ago that I think um, positioned me as kind of a nut job who just kind of said really out there things about with no evidence of what those out there things were, because everything I said, to your point, for the most part, has been proven true. Um, but there is still, yeah, this kind of, I, I mean, I have to say most of the press has been very positive or at least very neutral and balanced and, you know, broaches the subject of free speech and what should we be allowed to say as leaders in a company or employees and what should we not. Um, but no, certainly there have been no apologies. And I think there's still an effort to paint me as a lunatic. It's hard to deny logic. It's hard to deny when you're willing to say, look, I'll talk about this with anybody. Let's just look at the data. People can throw out these allegations, whereas you say, look, let's discuss it. Let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the data. Let's discuss this. People don't want to do that. They don't. They just want to kind of demonize you and call you names. And it's easier, you know, ad hominem attacks are much easier. And, you know, I should say that the virtual world we all live in makes that easier and makes it worse. It's incredibly corrosive to the way we talk to each other, to the discourse. You can call someone names anonymously. I mean, we had these town halls every couple of weeks. I was called terrible names in every one by anonymous folks from within the company in my own community. I don't think that would happen if we were in person and somebody had to stand up and look me in the eye and call me a racist. I just, I don't think it would. I don't think that would happen. That's not how we engage with each other when we do it in person. And, you know, I repeatedly reached out to folks who were very critical. I got no response. I, you know, I was very willing to kind of explain my views, but that's not how it works. We just demonize people. And to your 
point in the opening, we just cancel them. And if you veer one iota from, and I think it's, it's really, it happens on the right and the left, but you know, my experience is on the left. If you veer one sort of just baby step away from the kind of left-wing orthodoxy, you are a white supremacist. You were actually called a racist as part of this. Where the hell did that come from? Because if you wanted schools to open, which were predominantly populated by non-white children, that meant you wanted those children to die. That's the rationale, the line of thinking. That's just disgusting. It's absurd on its face. And, you know, at first when it came at me, I was very upset. Um, I felt like I needed to kind of defend myself and explain myself. Now, frankly, if people come at me with that, which they still do, I just say, I reject that. That's that's stupid. I'm not. It's dumb. I'm not. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not. <laughs> Two of my children are mixed race. My team was the most diverse team in the country. I mean, in the company, like look at the arc of my life and what I have done and what I have advocated for. It's a, it's a, it's a silly, frankly, thing to say, but it's incredibly damaging. It's reputationally damaging. I believe that word alone made me unemployable there. Who wants to keep a racist in the seat of global brand president? Well, of course. And you were offered a million-dollar severance package if you would just zip it, right? If you would just not say anymore. Yeah. I mean, as this sort of whole process advanced over the course of two years, please be quiet. No, I don't want to be quiet. Uh, I mean, and I should say, like, to me, I just, it was, it was, I could not say a thing that was true. Being told you can't say these things that are true is just flies in the face of what our democracy is supposed to be about. And submitting to that seemed very dangerous to me. And I also would say standing up for kids. I mean, I wish someone had stood up for me as a child in this, you know, abusive, abusive sport. And so those two things drove me forward. At a certain point, they did it. Uh, it was actually discussed that I might be the CEO, the next CEO. Um, but they needed to do a background check and they needed to kind of assess all of this social media presence. And I, I said, I agreed to it. And I said at the very beginning to my boss, the CEO, I, I know what you're going to find. You're going to find that it's going to be sort of a gray area, but you're going to determine that it's too problematic for me, not only to take over as CEO, but to work here anymore, which is exactly what happened. He gave me the results of the, the investigation, uh, which included other things, financial, et cetera. Um, and I was told there's not a place for me anymore in the company, but that I would be offered severance. And I decided to leave on my own terms. So what's next for you? What do you do now? And then I've got some questions that are a little yeah. broader. I'm sort of figuring that out. You know, I assumed that quitting in the public fashion that I did would mean that I could never work in the corporate world again, which apparently is not true. I do get quite a few calls. Um, regularly about about corporate roles. So that's an option. I'm going to not avail myself of that for a little bit. I'm writing a book and I'm making a documentary about the harms of school closures to kids. So I want to do that in the near term and um, and figure out what's next. I'm doing speaking engagements, that kind of thing. So I can take a beat and a breath. I need to make a living. I have four children, um, although one is 21 and launched into the world. So I don't have to worry about him as much anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, a corporate job at some point is definitely an option, which I did not expect. What do we do about this? I'm in Hollywood where I'm sitting at Paramount Studios right now. The cancel culture has never been more sensitized and more activated I guess, than in Hollywood, very oh, left. universities. Yes. Universities. Yeah, universities in Hollywood. I read a study recently that said one-third of university students believe that it is okay to yell down a speaker that you disagree with. I always thought universities were a place you go for an exchange of ideas. That's where you have one side here, another side here. You have an exchange of ideas. You learn from each other. Maybe you never agree, but you certainly get enlightened about what the other side is all about. We have definitely lost that. I did a focus group recently with a colleague of mine, Frank Luntz, and we had 
40 students from USC, 20 on the left, 20 on the right, to try to sit down and see if there was a way to start a conversation instead of a battle. It just seems really difficult now. Where do you think we're headed with all of this cancel culture and divisiveness? This is the, the, I- This is the thing that is most alarming to me. And I know it's been building and I I think it started at the university level, but it is infecting all of our institutions is, 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 is the world, it's not okay. I, I don't accept that there's a world that we could possibly live in where if I veer from democratic orthodoxy, I can't hold a job in a company or that we have two separate worlds and you have a you know Republican world and a Democratic world. Um, and I don't accept that we, that some speech is just too dangerous. You know, somebody said to me yesterday, he was having a conversation with someone who said, I believe in free speech, but not for right wing people. Well, that you, you can't, you can't have that. That's not free speech. It's the most ludicrous thing I've ever heard. And I think the only antidote is people like us have to just say the thing. You just have to, you have to keep doing it. And I feel like, what can they do to me now? I don't have a job. I, um, all the things I was afraid of happening happened and I'm still standing. I've been called all the names, I lost my job. And so we, and it's a growing community, it's small, but the only antidote is to say the thing, say the truth, say the thing you believe. Um, and have the conversations, force the conversations, because if you do it, it gives somebody else the courage to do it. And, you know, one of the things I'm most struck by with my story is on February 13th or 14th, sorry, I resigned and I, you know, published a piece on Barry Weiss's Common Sense Substack about what happened to me, everything I just described here. The very next day in San Francisco, the school board was recalled, three members of the school board. And they were called largely for not opening schools. 75% of voters voted to recall. What that says to me is that we are the silent majority, but they were, they were being ruled by this tyrannical minority. Nobody in San Francisco would speak up. If 75% of the parents had done, I wouldn't have been alone. I wouldn't have been deemed this horrible villain that was worth firing. And more importantly, schools would have opened. But everyone's too afraid because they see the dragging you get and the name calling. But that's why those of us who are willing to do it have to just do it because you bring others along. You do. And we just have to keep doing it. I don't know what else to do other than that and support organizations that support free speech, which the ACLU does not anymore. So, you know, they used to, but they do not anymore. Um, An organization called Fire Fire does. And so my donation dollars are shifting to them. Um, I I, I don't have another answer, but that's why I want to write the book and I want to make the film um, because I just want to continue to use my voice. And when it comes to schools, in terms of the film, I want an accurate accounting of what happened because it cannot happen again. And we need an accurate recording of where kids are right now so that we can help them move forward. We have to identify the gaps and help them. And if we're not even willing to say that there were harms done collectively, then we can't help them. Well, It's going to take legislative action because raising awareness is one thing, but if you don't put money into the curriculum, if you don't put extra funds into the educational curriculum to close the gap, then it'll never happen. It'll just kind of get back to it. They'll downgrade the curriculum. And then 10 years from now, they'll start decrying why we're not competitive in the world market. Because we have a generation of kids that are not competitive in math and science and all of these areas that we need to be competitive in. And then somebody like you or Dimitri Kostakis, who's an epidemiological pediatrician, will come along and say, well, here's why. And then people go, oh, gee, well, I wish we'd have dealt with that when we should have dealt with it. That's what needs to happen now. I just believe strongly that the loudest voice doesn't always deserve the most attention. And that's what's happening right now. We have, as you said, we got a very vocal minority that has this agenda and it's emotional extortion. It's like, if you don't give in to the mob mentality, 
will cease to attend your university, we'll cease to buy your products, we'll cease to do whatever commerce we can, and so people sell out. Yes, but leaders need to exhibit a degree of moral courage here. And I I would say um, the Netflix guy, and I know their business performance is poor right now, but he recently made a statement or sent a letter to the employees saying, if you do not support, you know, content that comes from various perspectives and free speech and all of this, then this may not be the place to work for you anymore. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now he could have, because there's been a lot of controversy because he allowed Dave Chappelle to stay on the platform. He could have pulled it and the very small percentage who were insisting it needed to be taken down because speech is violence. And he didn't. And guess what? It's going to be okay. And guess what? The guy from Spotify didn't take Rogan down either. You just need a few people with some backbone and some moral courage. It's a minority on both sides. It's a minority on the far left and it's a minority on the far right. Most people are pretty sensible and somewhere kind of in the middle. But they need to mobilize. And people need to understand Twitter isn't a real place. That's it's not, not. A, it's not a real place. I know. Dave Chappelle said that Twitter is not a real place. It isn't a real place. And the views expressed are sort of more from that minority. You have, you know, a lot of people in the middle who just lurk and look. It's not a real place. But here's what's alarming about it. It can have real world impact. Because I would make the case, and I think you know, my old boss at Levi's would say this. I got fired. At least 50% of the reason was because I was on Twitter and because a few people on Twitter really hated me. Yeah. So it had a real world impact. Because it gets the media's attention and it makes a headline that becomes news and they don't tell the whole story. They tell the sensational part of the story. They get the quotes and people say things on Twitter they wouldn't say to you in an elevator. Yeah, especially if they're not using their real name. Exactly. It's anonymous, and if they were standing next to you in the grocery line, they wouldn't say, hey, Jennifer, they're keyboard bullies. Yeah, they are. And it's why, and and, you know, I joined Twitter many years ago at this point and was not very active until 2020, um, but it's why I always use my real name. I want to be accountable for the things I say. I stand by everything I said. There are some things I deleted because my company asked me to. I went back and found them in the Wayback Machine. I stand by all of them. I still stand by everything I said. And you know what? If I got some stuff wrong, so what? That doesn't mean I don't get to say it. Yeah, that's the whole idea of free speech. And you don't have to be perfect. You just have to be sincere. And you can take it back. You can change it. You can correct it. You can modify it. That's right. And if we can't have these debates about serious issues, we can't actually get to the truth. We get things wrong along the way. Um, If we can't even have the debate about kids and schools and the harms, it's just too dangerous to even have it. We'll never get to the truth. The truth becomes government provided talking points. And that's no better than any authoritarian regime, honestly. No, it's not. And you must find some comfort in knowing that the things that they tried to get you to stop saying, to not talk about, have proven to be not only logical, but supported, sadly, supported by science. I mean, sadly, it's sad that you're right The school should have been open. The kids are suffering. I'm sorry that that's true, but it is true. At least the schools are opening. And now I'm just really hoping they don't close again. I I agree with you. And I think that's a distinct possibility to have periodic closures, which is not okay when you have a student population that's already disengaged and behind. I mean, it's cold comfort, as you might imagine, um, to have been right on this because the kids are the ones that were harmed. And... I don't get a prize for having been right. I have to sit and, you know, understand that these kids are suffering and they have indeed been harmed. And I, it's not like I get my job back. Um, and it's not like, at least not yet, I don't think we've learned a lesson about speech. I don't. I, and, and the need for it and the need for open debate and dissent to support this sort of project that is America. Well, as you said, people need to find the courage to speak out. And you're showing the courage to speak out now. We're having this conversation. And trust me, a lot of people are going to hear this conversation. Well, that makes me happy. Good. I really hope that it encourages people to speak out and support this and do it in their own life. 
I tell people all the time, small changes accumulate to big results across time. Maybe it's somebody speaking up at work, speaking up for their child, saying something at school. If we just have more and more people find their voice and speak out across time, then maybe we can balance the playing field. That's what my hope is. I think that's right. And, you know, that was what I was sort of advising folks who would talk to me throughout the course. What people would say, what can I do? At your, your child's preschool, where your two-year-old is forced to mask, your two-year-old who still wears diapers, puts her shoes on the wrong feet, and is learning to talk, but is forced to mask every day, just say something. Tell the, tell the folks running the school that you do not support it. If you don't say it, they think everybody does. In your world, in your community, just say something. You may not win, but you might get another mom to say it or another dad. And maybe there's another. And maybe there are a lot of parents that don't want two-year-olds masked. It, you know, I mean, it's just like find your little spot and do it. And I think if more people did it, you're right. It creates a groundswell of change. Yeah, and then pretty soon you're a chorus of parents, and then they have to start listening. Well, listen, I can't thank you enough for talking to me today, and you've got these projects that you're working on, and when they're done, you're going to need a place to launch them, and just know my platform is here and ready for you, both digitally and linearly on my broadcast show and on this show, and wherever you need. I know you'll have a lot of options. Add mine to the list because we'll join the chorus in supporting these projects that you're getting the word out on. So anything I can do to help, you just let me know. I so appreciate that. I mean, one of the things I'm most grateful for is I found this community that is small but mighty um, of, you know, heterodox thinkers and people willing to challenge the narrative. And we all come from different backgrounds, um, religious backgrounds, political backgrounds, but we value free speech. And I, um, I so appreciate your support and just being part of this, this broader community now. Thank you. I'm from Texas, so when I say it, I do it. When you need me, I'm here. You just let me know. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Phil. Thanks nice so much you. for talking to me today. I expected this to be a great conversation and exceeded all expectations. Awesome. Congratulations on what you're doing, and I'll be here when you need me, Jennifer. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Bye.